Okay, so this is really part two of warrantless searches, right? Um, we left off last class with a hypothetical, right? We said that um, you and your roommate maybe have a campus off part or off uh, apartment off campus, right? Just to make it easier, um, and police come and they want to search your home. You're not there, but your roommate is, right? And the roommate says, come on in. What can we do, right? Is that allowable? And where can the police search? And we'll talk all about that in a second. So the thing that you need to understand is that an individual may val validly consent to a search if he or she possesses what's called common authority over the premises to be searched. So common authority is this idea that we know that you have a roommate, but you or your roommate could theoretically consent to this search. But, and here's the but, um, common authority means places within your home that are common, that you both have control over, right? So if we think about uh, an apartment, you have your room, your roommate has his or her room, and you have a living room. So the, what this kind of boils down to is the police could search anywhere you had common authority. Well, did, does your roommate have common authority in your room? Probably not. I mean, it depends on the setup, but generally no. Does the roommate have common authority over his room? Yes. Does the roommate have common authority over the living room? Theoretically, you both share it, so yes. So anywhere where there's common authority, the police can, be ser can search. Now the Fourth Amendment requires what's called actual authority or reasonable reliance. Right? And some states do not accept the reasonable reliance doctrine. Right? So if we look at Illinois versus Rodriguez, um, it gives us a good indicator. So basically the idea of actual authority is you have to actually possess the authority to say, yes, come on in and search. Uh, again, some states don't allow reasonable reliance. The, the federal government allows reasonable reliance. And reasonable reliance is essentially um, the police had no real reason to question if you could give consent to search or not, right? So they knock on your door, you open it up, they say, we're so and so police department, we'd like to conduct a search. Um, what's your name? And you give them the name of the people who live there, a false name. And they ask, do you live here? And you say, yes, well, you don't live there. Um, and they have no real reason to doubt what you're saying. So you say, yeah, come on in and search. Um, that's reasonable reliance, right? It was not necessarily unreasonable to rely. Uh, but again, some states say, no, regardless of reasonable reliance, you have to have actual authority. So there are some common uh, challenges to authority, right? So we just talked about the roommate example. So the roommate can consent to anywhere that is within the common domain, right? So um, living room, kitchen, if there's a shared bathroom, um, their room, but they cannot consent to your space, right? So the police can't come in and search your room. Now, this gets a little bit tricky and a little bit different when it comes to dorms, uh, but we're assuming that you have an off-campus apartment. So again, common authority is basically you can search anywhere that I share or that I have, but you can't search somewhere where somebody else has a reasonable expectation of privacy. That raises then the question of, okay, what if they're not roommates? What if they're spouses? So generally speaking, Spouses, um, if one consents and the other one doesn't, um, all you need is one person to consent. Both parties do not have to agree. Now, spouses have this really interesting dynamic because theoretically, unlike roommates who, are, who have their separate places and things like that, spouses share common authority basically over the entire um, home, right? So generally speaking, if a spouse says, yes, you can come in and search, and the other one says, no, you can't, 
they can search the whole house um, unless you as a spouse have taken measures to ensure that you have some sort of privacy or some room set aside that only you are allowed to go into, right? So think of this as um, not to be stereotypical, but we're gonna be stereotypical. Um, think of like the man cave and then think of a woman's walk-in closet, right? Um, generally speaking, the male is probably not welcome in the walk-in closet and generally speaking, the female is probably not welcome in the, the, the man cave. That might be enough to say, okay, you can search everywhere but these two places or whoever consented to the place. Um, but that gets tricky, right? Because again, we're talking about reasonable reliance and actual authority. And generally speaking, spouses are gonna share a domicile 100%. Then we have the question of parents and children. So let's say that, well, you're, some of you are, are at home right now. Um, let's say please come knocking on your door, it's your parents' home, and you were just kind of crashing there for the night, or maybe you live there, we'll see. Um, and please come to the door and they say, can we search your house? Now, generally speaking, children can permit searches as long as they're over the age of 18. Right now, this does raise problems with common authority. Right, so the idea is you're probably not going to be welcome in your parent bedroom, um, but anywhere else you might have free reign. Right, so again, the police have to be very cautious about where they search and whom they search. Now, if you're under age of 18, a child cannot consent to a search. However, if the child is 17 and tells the police they're actually 18 and the police have no reason to doubt it, then reasonable reliance comes into play and the search is permissible. This gets us down a new vein, right? So these are all kind of shared spaces. What about spaces that are a little bit different? So think of a motel, right? You're staying in a hotel and please say, we want to search room 107. Can the hotel or motel clerk say, yes, you can search room 107? Generally speaking, no. Uh, the rationale behind this is uh, that you have essentially, all, all a, a hotel stay is, is a very, very, very short-term lease, right? And so basically you, in a short-term lease or any kind of lease, you are presumed to take full control of the, pres or the, the, the property being leased, right? The property being rented. So does the motel clerk have common authority? No, generally speaking, no. Now there are exceptions to the exception, but generally speaking, no. Um, motel clerks can't consent to a search of your hotel room uh, that's being, again, lawfully uh, occupied. The same holds true for a landlord, right? So um, what's interesting about landlords um, is how they word their lease. And this is really what you have to pay attention to in, in your lease. Um, especially if you are engaged in nefarious activity. So a landlord, right, when they rent you a premises, basically they give you full control over that premises minus anything that they put into the lease. Now, that being said, we have an interesting situation where the lease says that the um, landlord can come in and search or look around your apartment uh, at any time right a lot of a lot of the leases will have some kind of provision along those lines or it might even try to involve law enforcement or something like that now can the landlord come in and search well according to the terms of the lease yeah can the police come in and search generally speaking no Right, just because the landlord can look around, landlord doesn't can't look inside drawers, can't open up your cupboards or anything along those lines. Right, the, all the landlord can do is just make sure the premises are being maintained, and that is it. So we don't really think that they have common control um, or common authority. You will see in leases as you grow older that um, landlords try to be somewhat 
not tricky, but they try to cover their own backside because there's this concept called civil forfeiture. And basically civil forfeiture means if a premises is being used in an illegal manner, theoretically, the police, the state have the right to take that premises and sell it. So that applies to landlords as well, right? So think of a big apartment complex. Big apartment complex and you have somebody there dealing drugs, theoretically under civil forfeiture statutes, they could seize the entire complex and sell it and you would be kind of out of luck. Um, now there's a lot more to civil forfeiture and we'll talk about that much later in the course, uh, but that's just a very high level overview. So the next question is, what about employers? Can an employer allow a search of your work area? Absolutely, right? Again, we, we believe this idea of common authority. They have the authority to look in where they want at any time because they're your employer. It's basically their property, their stuff. You're not renting it from them. You don't have an expectation of privacy in it, et cetera. Now, this, is, this does have a caveat. Um, when it comes to employers searching like a locked desk or a locker, somewhere where you have shown that you have an expectation of privacy, generally speaking, the employer can consent to a search anywhere, but if they want to get into that desk or if they want to get into that's locked or they want to get into the filing cabinet that's locked or something along those lines that nobody else has a key to, that only this person has a key to, then we're going to say they probably have an expectation of privacy and we might need a warrant at that point. Another question comes up with valets. All right, so valet, obviously, when you, if you go to somewhere nice and um, they have valets, right, you just get out of your car, they park your car and they bring the keys in and, and you pick them up when you're ready to leave. So there have been cases where police have followed a car when it got into the hands of the valet, they stop the valet and say, can we search your vehicle? Now again, there's no real common authority here, right? You're giving the person, theoretically the valet, the uh, limited right to drive your vehicle a very short distance and return the keys to you immediately. Valets do not have the right, in fact, can be fired and sued for going through your belongings. Right, so they don't have common authority over your vehicle. And this is especially true of closed off spaces, right? Like an armrest or um, a glove compartment, something along those lines. So, <laughs> when we talk about automobile searches, um, these are interesting is what we're gonna see is there's a development in automobile searches, right? So generally speaking, if we wanna search a vehicle, um, as long as the officer has probable cause, they don't need a warrant. Now the rationale behind this is, unlike a house, cars can move. Right, so if theoretically the police wanted to search your, your vehicle, um, they have more incentive and more interest in searching your vehicle um, and holding you there instead of trying to get a warrant, because if they're trying to get a warrant and they let you go, like, are you gonna leave? Yeah, absolutely you are, right? Whereas you can't necessarily move an entire house. Um, we'll talk about RVs in a second. Um, that being said, this includes containers within the vehicle, right? So if they have probable cause to believe that there is like a dime bag of, of heroin in your vehicle, um, they can search anywhere in the vehicle, right? Even like containers. Um, however, if the probable cause is limited solely to the container, then only the container may be searched and not the whole vehicle. Right, so if they believe that your dime bag of heroin is in, a, in this coffee cup um, and that's all they have probable cause to believe and they see you put it in your car, they can't search your whole car, they can only search the coffee cup, right? 
Um, now we're going to take a step back from that later when we look at automobile searches and, and um, being able to pull a vehicle over without probable cause. But for right now, just assume that you need probable cause to search a vehicle, but you don't need a warrant. Now that being said, the reason behind this is not only that vehicles can move, but it's also that you have a reduced expectation of privacy in your vehicle, right? So you do have an expectation of privacy, but unlike your home, your vehicle is subject to a lot more things, right? So for instance, most vehicles have windows all the way around them. So if you're trying to keep something secret, you're probably not gonna do it where somebody can see through. Your vehicles are subject to regulation, right? In the state of New York, they have to be inspected every year. Um, they have to, you have to go through a tag process, you have to go through all kinds of government processes. So theoretically at any point, somebody could discover something in your vehicle, right? When they're doing their maintenance or, or whatever it is. So you still have an expectation of privacy, but significantly reduced. Usually our expectation of privacy is gonna occur in the trunk, the glove compartment, the armrest, right? Places where people cannot see. Um, so again, uh, plain view applies, right? So if you leave a, let's say, handgun on your driver's seat, and police officer is walking by on the sidewalk where they have the lawful right to be, they look over and see the handgun in your seat, well, they're gonna be able to search your vehicle, right? Again, because you, you don't have more. Now that being said, this past term, the Supreme Court came out with a new case uh, that I've uploaded for you that dealt with, okay, what if it's a vehicle, but the vehicle is in the driveway parked of a house, right? It's on the chattel of a house. Can't, do we need a warrant then? Historically, the answer's been, no, it's a vehicle. You can conduct the search. The Supreme Court did a complete 180 this past term and said, if your vehicle is parked in your driveway, on the chattel of your house, we consider it an extension of your house and therefore a warrant is needed, right? Because theoretically they're still coming onto your property. So that they didn't get into whether that would apply to like parking on the street or things like that. But if your vehicle is on your property, uh, specifically in the driveway, then police need a warrant to search. Now, again, this kind of comes down to the idea that yes, vehicles are movable, but if you're parked in your driveway, the police can like detain you enough to get a, a, a warrant or something along those lines. There's no immediate danger to the vehicle um, or the evidence within the vehicle, I should say. Now, motorhomes or, or um, mobile homes, I should say, present a unique challenge, right? So if you all read California vs. Carney, it's a really interesting case um, that dealt with motorhomes. So how do we classify what a motorhome is? Because in one respect, it's a home, right? It's, it's a domicile, it's a place that you can live. In another respect, it's a vehicle, it's mobile. So how do we deal with this? Well, California versus Carding tells us that we deal with the motorhome on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on how the motor home functions, right? So let's say that the motor home is in a trailer park, it's connected to electricity, the sewer, water, et cetera, right? In that case, we're gonna presume that that motor home is a home, right? Um, if, however, it's disconnected from that stuff, right, and it's ready to be driven away, then we're gonna say that the motorhome is a car. And again, we don't need a warrant to search a vehicle. So motorhome is very tricky, um, and, and the analysis can get very tricky, but I think California versus Carney leaves, uh, lays out a very good um, explanation and kind of how we do it and the reasons behind it. So, Again, that leaves us with the, the motorhome example. Now, we have something that's called an inventory search, right? So 
let's say um, police seize your vehicle. Or it's maybe had too many parking tickets or something like that, and they seize your vehicle. It's in their care, custody, and control. So there's no jeopardy of evidence being tampered with or destroyed or anything along those lines. Do police need a warrant when seizing a vehicle to search it? The answer is it depends. So once they have control over it, remember this is kind of similar to search incident to arrest, once they have control over the, the situation, um, if they're trying to obtain criminal evidence, like that's their primary goal, and we're gonna say that with like a wink in a second, um, the primary goal is to obtain criminal evidence or criminal investigation, then generally speaking, they'll probably need a warrant. However, if, if the police department has procedures in place, right, of what's called an inventory search, then generally speaking, no warrant is needed. So the idea of an inventory search is when police take a car to an impound lot, right, whether it's a police impound lot, city impound lot, whatever, um, you know, jail for your car, basically, until you pay your tickets or maybe they arrest you for driving under the influence and they have the car towed to the impound lot and you have to pay all those fees that are associated with it, whatever. Can't please search your vehicle. So the answer is, in this case, yes, but three things have to be present, right? So first, the search is not designed to further a criminal investigation. The idea behind an inventory search is literally the police are going through the vehicle to write down everything that is in the vehicle so that if there's an issue later and you say, oh, you stole so-and-so out of my car, the police can say, no, we have a record of it not being in there. Right? That's the theory behind it. Um, and for a long time, that's what police did. Now, that being said, the search has to occur as soon as reasonable. So once they get it back to the impound lot, then they search it, and then we're going to say, generally speaking, they don't need a warrant, right? Because, again, the whole point of the inventory search is to make sure that things don't get stolen out of your vehicle or that you don't claim there's something in your vehicle that's not there. So it makes sense to leave it sitting for a week and then do an inventory search, right? Because we want to do it as soon as it comes in. And then the final requirement is the search is a standardized and reasonable procedure in place before the seizure. So there's a uniform application, right? So the police don't just ad hoc search vehicles. They search every vehicle that comes into the impound lot. Um, now, this is done with kind of a wink in your eye, right? Because when the Supreme Court articulated that you have to have uh, standardized procedures and basically have to do every car that comes into your impound lot, suddenly police departments all got this new policy that they will search vehicles when they come into their impound lot for inventory purposes. Uh, so that's when we say, yeah, technically it's for inventory purposes, but realistically is it? Usually no. Now that being said, inventory searches also apply to containers in the vehicle as well. So let's say that you have uh, in the back seat, you have a box, right? And the box is taped shut. Um, just you know, a little bit piece of tape, it's not like bundled up, but it's just it's taped shut. Um, and police are doing an inventory search and they get to the back seat and they find this box. Now, from a lawyer's point of view, what's their best option? Best option is always to get a warrant. So if you can get a warrant, awesome. But let's say they don't have probable cause. It's just a box, a back seat of a car, car got towed for DUI. Um, to cover the police's backside, the best thing for them to do is to open that via, or open that container. Right? And that's for a couple of reasons. One, that way they don't get sued for theoretically stealing whatever was in that container. Um, two, they know there's nothing dangerous within the container. Right? And then three, if it so happens to lead to criminal evidence, then so be it, right? So they can search containers in the vehicle um, as well. Now, they can't go too far, 
right? Because remember, we occur, we talked about there's a reasonableness standard here. Um, so when police are doing an inventory search, generally speaking, they can't remove the liner from your trunk, right, to search in, in the, the spaces in the trunk. Um, they get in the trunk, but they can't take that carpeting, that like really weird carpeting, um, and pull it down and put it back up when they're done. They can't do that. Um, the idea is you're just looking for stuff so that somebody can't claim you stole something later. Now, this is really important, right? Inventory searches are extremely important because there is something called inevitable discovery. So let's say that police have an arrest warrant, um, but they have, or they don't even have a warrant. Um, let's say that, um, you know, uh, you're challenging the fact that they didn't have a warrant to search your vehicle, right? Um, and this is true not just for vehicles, but homes and things like that. If police conduct a search without a warrant, when they needed a warrant, but they would have found the evidence anyway, right, if they had done things properly, then we'll call it inevitable discovery, right? So let's say that they don't have, police don't have a good reason to stop you, right? And they arrest you on the side of the road. They take you to the station, right? Maybe it's DUI, maybe it's not, who knows? But they don't have the right cause, right? They don't have what will actually be reasonable suspicion. They don't have that. But they take you to the station, right? So then a wrecker or tow truck comes and um, takes your vehicle to the city impound lot. And while it's in the city impound lot, they find heroin in the back seat of your vehicle. Generally speaking, you would think like, okay, that would be thrown out, right? Because, you know, they didn't have a warrant to search the vehicle, but because of the inevitable discovery rule, they don't really need one. Um, inevitable discovery basically says, look, if the police aren't following their job, if they're not getting a warrant when they're supposed to get a warrant, but they would have found the thing anyway, right? So they would have naturally come across it. Uh, they wouldn't have needed a warrant to get into somewhere to find it. They would have naturally come across it. It was inevitable that they would discover this evidence. Then we say, yes, your rights were violated. However, because of the inevitable discovery rule, right, the fact that um, this changes things, um, we're not gonna suppress the evidence. Right? So the inevitable discovery rule becomes very, very important. And again, it's part of the reason why so many police departments have inventory search policies is because of the inevitable discovery rule. So if they mess something up prior to a car coming in and they find something in the car that's incriminating, they can say, well, it was inevitable discovery, right? It was gonna be towed no matter what. Um, so we were gonna find it either way, right? whether it was a justified reason for towing it or non-justified reason for towing it. So that moves us into um, inspections and regulatory searches, right? So we're kind of moving out of the realm of vehicles and we'll come back to vehicles in, in a while, but especially when we're talking about arrests. But when um, we are looking at inspections and regulatory searches, generally speaking, even when the purpose of a search is not criminal in nature, citizens still retain a Fourth Amendment right to be free from unreasonable searches. So what does this mean? It means the Fourth Amendment doesn't just apply to the police. The Fourth Amendment applies to the government. So if somebody is a part of the government and they search your home, you have a Fourth Amendment right. Now, that being said, we're thinking of non-criminal searches 
a non-criminal search also requires probable cause, right? So um, the idea here is maybe there's a public health issue, right? So maybe you are Maybe you have some sort of disease that can spread very easily to your neighbors and things like that. Um, and they want to come in and make sure that you aren't traveling or, or, or whatever they want to do, right? Um, it's, let's say it's the local health department. That's a non-criminal search, right? They're not trying to bust you for a crime or anything like that, but they still need probable cause to come in to rectify or to believe that there is some kind of public health issue stemming from your home. Now, when probable cause is difficult or impossible to establish, right? so especially for administrative agencies, they may, re may rely upon something called modified probable cause and or area warrants, right? where there's a significant government interest. So think of something like a building inspection, right? So you have fire marshals come in and they inspect your home, they inspect your, your business, right? Um, that's technically a search, right? Because they're searching for something that could be a danger to the community or something along those lines. Now, do they have probable cause? Maybe, maybe not. But if we allow modified probable cause or area warrants where we say you can search this general area for whatever you need to search, um, in that instance, then they can search, right? Because the administrative agencies basically said, yeah, you don't need probable cause to conduct a routine search because it's routine. Um, if it's non-routine, then you're probably going to need probable cause. And then area warrants, again, this is kind of back to the public health thing. We know that there's this nasty, this horrible smell coming from an apartment complex, right? And it's making people sick. So the idea is we can say you have a warrant to search the entire apartment complex for the source of the smell, right? That's an area warrant, right? Because you're not specifying a specific place you're just saying, generally speaking. Now, you might say, this seems a little contrary to what we learned before, that warrants have to be very particular. That's true. But the idea behind this um, is we're not doing it for criminal purposes. We're still governed by probable cause to a degree we're doing it for significant government interests, the safety of people, safety of, of everyone. Um, so maybe we don't need traditional probable cause. Because uh, again, nobody's getting in trouble theoretically. Well, I mean, you can, but theoretically that's not the purpose of this. The purpose is to rectify a situation that is making people sick or there's some kind of other issue to, or some kind of other reason to believe an issue exists. Now, that being said, um, in some limited instances, especially this is true with inspection and regulatory searches, citizens have no expectation of privacy in their business or conduct, right? So let's say that you have a business and that business is run out of an office building. Right? Nobody comes in to buy things or anything along those lines, right? You just, you have an office. Now, let's say you're solo practitioner. It's your own place. Theoretically, you have an expectation of privacy. And uh, that, even though it's a business, you have an expectation of privacy. So we need a warrant to search or modify probable cause or area warrant, something along those lines to search your, your premises. However, if the business that you're conducting is what's called a closely regulated business, then we say as a matter of law, you have no expectation of privacy. 
So generally speaking, this has to be codified in a statute in order to put businesses on notice. All right, and this is usually businesses that are dealing with things that are dangerous, right? So um, businesses that produce maybe nitroglycerin um, or TNT, they're closely regulated, right? And the statute basically says, um, yeah, you might not have the public come into your premises and it might just be you, but because it's so dangerous, we regulate it very closely. We say, you know, exactly how much you can have, when you can have it, where it can be stored, how can it be stored, et cetera, that you have no expectation of privacy, right? So you can't just leave your weed at your office if you are um, a closely regulated business. If you're a non-closely regulated business, remember, you do have an expectation of privacy, um, assuming that you know, customers are coming onto your premises that's not open to the public um, for like shopping or retail shopping. Because if a business is open to the public for retail shopping, generally speaking, there will be no um, expectation of privacy in there either. So that gets us to what we call special needs searches. So think of a spectrum. All right, on one end of the spectrum, we have a criminal search. On the other end of the spectrum, we have just a regulatory search, right? The idea is, is they have two different outcomes, two different purposes, et cetera. Special needs searches are a middle ground between criminal searches and non-criminal administrative searches that are conducted by law enforcement to promote the welfare and safety of individuals and the general public. So that being said, generally no warrant is required for these searches. So how do we deal with this, right? This again kind of goes back to a public health concern. Um, law enforcement are trying to promote welfare and safety of the general public. Um, and so they maybe are looking for unregistered firearms owned in, or owned by people in let's say um, a special apartment complex for people who've been convicted of felonies. I don't know that one exists, but let's say that it does. I mean, the police want to search for unlawful firearms because they think the public is a danger. So they're not trying to arrest anybody. They're not trying to investigate a crime. They're just trying to promote safety, but they are police. So what, how, when can we do this? Well, we have a two-step process, right? Or two-step test. The first prong of this test, we have to ask whether the search is being conducted to investigate a crime. The answer must be no. So if the search is being conducted to investigate a crime or to uncover criminals, then we're back to reasonable expectation of privacy, you need a warrant. Right. So if the purpose of the police going to this felon complex um, was to make arrests for felons in unlawful possession of a firearm, um, and that was their whole purpose was to make these arrests, and then no, we're going to require warrant, probable cause, etc. Um, if, however, the police have made it their goal or have said that they're not going to make arrests, they're just going to seize the weapons and let the parties go about their business, then we move to step two because now the answer is yes, or the answer is no, we're not conducting this for a criminal investigation. So step two tells us and makes us question whether the search is reasonable given the government's interests compared to individual privacy interests. Right, so again, generally speaking, there's no warrant required for these special needs searches. So think about our felon complex example. Um, what are the government's interests compared to individual privacy interests? Well, we have individuals who are at home, and remember, your home is your castle. It's the most sacred place we can imagine, and we're talking about uh, Fourth Amendment search and seizure law. But on the other hand, what's the government interests in keeping firearms out of the 
hands of violent felons. That's a pretty significant search, um, pretty significant comparison. Now, the smart thing to do is always get a warrant, right? Always, always, always get a warrant. If, however, you don't get a warrant and theoretically you're, you state that you're not there to arrest people, you're not there to conduct an investigation of a crime, but you stumble across something like a firearm, right, that was in the possession of a felon, can you make an arrest? Yes. Right, so it's a little tongue in cheek when we say, like, is it being done to investigate a crime? Well, no. But if we find something, then we can make an arrest. It's a little tongue in cheek. Um, it becomes a little easier to understand if we take it out of a police context, right? Um, or at least a, a policing of, 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 of felons and things like that. Um, so, so they, let's say we have that smell example, right? And it's, 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 it's making people nauseous, making people sick. And so the police are called to investigate. Now, are they trying to find criminal activity? No, they don't know what's going on. They're there, maybe they have their, their dogs, their, their, sniff, their, their, their crime scene dogs out and they're going from like apartment to apartment to see where it is. Now, they, let's say they find one apartment that they, they think this is where it's coming from, right? So they decide to enter the apartment without a warrant and look around to see if this is the source of the smell. So we've met step one, right? The idea is they're, you know, they're not there to investigate a crime. But if we investigate, if we go to move step two, we have to say, was it reasonable given the government's interest compared to individual privacy, right? So while you are the king of your castle, if your castle is making people sick, or maybe there's a dead body, or who knows what, um, then the government's interest is very strong, and they're probably going to be able to come in and search without a warrant. But again, the idea behind it is not to make arrests, not to investigate a crime, but to protect the general welfare and safety of individuals and the general public. So when we're thinking about special needs searches, one great example is international borders, right? So basically at a border or what's called a border equivalent, the government can conduct a search with basically near impunity. So when we say at the border, we mean the physical border, right? So we're talking the United States Canadian border, we're talking the United States Mexican border. Border equivalents are, have been translated to be um, searches or excuse me, uh, areas that function like a border. And you're like, what, what does that mean? Um, so for instance, there is a border equivalent in St. Louis, Missouri, right? Middle of the country, because there's an international airport there. And what we say is a border equivalent is basically like the international departures and arrivals um, section of the airport, right? Because that's people coming in from different countries, right? That's a, that's a border equivalent, right? So even though it's not the physical border, it's basically the border, right? Um, and generally speaking, you're on soil of your own country until you pass through customs, at which point you're on U.S. soil. So it, 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 yeah, it, it acts as a border. Now, generally speaking, for what's called routine border searches, basically, which are those a person would normally expect right, at a border, we don't have to have any articulable suspicion. No articulable suspicion is required. Um, we don't have to have any suspicion. We can just randomly go through your stuff, right? Um, and that's usually like we can look through your car, uh, maybe we can look through your bags, you know, things like that. Um, and we don't have to have any suspicion. 
So if you go through like a border and like they, they flag you over to a secondary inspection point, and you legitimately don't have anything in your car, don't worry about it. It's just routine. They don't have any suspicion and then it is what it is. Now, if it's a non-routine border search, and we define a non-routine border search as a search that's invasive, so invasive that it impedes on an individual's dignity and privacy. For these, we require an articulable suspicion, right? So something beyond a hunch. Um, so think of something like your cell phone, right? Um, just speaking at the borders, we're not going to be concerned about a cell phone. But we have some reason to believe, right, something beyond a hunch, we have something that we can articulate, a reason to believe that you have something in your cell phone that you shouldn't have. At this point, we're going to say it's probably a non-routine border search because it's invasive, right, it does get into your dignity and your privacy. So we're going to require an articulable suspicion. There is a caveat. The caveat is, once again, vehicle searches. So when we search a vehicle at a border, no matter how exhaustive we are in searching this vehicle, no articulable suspicion is required. All right, so think of United States versus Flores Montano. Um, it's a 2004 case, and basically what happened is Border Patrol like, basically disassembled an entire vehicle because they thought that th this person was a drug runner, and they were trying to find the drugs. They finally find them in the gas tank, but they took apart the whole car. And we say, do you have to have any kind of suspicion for that? And the answer is, no, it's a vehicle, right? If we want to look through your phone, we're going to have to have articulable suspicion. If it's a vehicle, we can take that bitch apart. Um, and the idea behind this is that's how people going across the border sneak stuff where people in, right? Is hidden compartments in vehicles. It was interesting. I had a, a professor once who told me how, I told the class, I should say, how far criminals will go to sneak things across borders, right? So in this one case, the police had a really good reason to believe that this, this person was a drug smuggler, right? And, and I mean, like, they, they basically knew it, they just needed proof. Um, so they're at the border, right? Comes across the border. And they have him wait while they disassemble their vehicle, while they go through the vehicle. Um, in this instance, the police or the border patrol did not disassemble the vehicle. Like they looked everywhere they thought they could find something. Um, but they couldn't find something. And they were, they, were, they were pissed because even the drug sniffing dogs were like, yeah, there's something in this car and they couldn't find it, right? So right before they're about to give the car back to the man um, and just say, you know, go, there's nothing we can do. One of the agents <laughs> turns on the radio, right? Why, I have no idea turns on the radio. Well, they're going to drive the vehicle back over to where the guy is. So they turn on the radio and they flip it to a certain channel. I think it was like 107 point something. As soon as that vehicle went into neutral before it went into drive, a secret compartment opened up. Like there was, it was hidden in the dash. Like it had, and, and, and they investigated it further because that's where they found the drugs. Um, and they found out that, yeah, this guy had the, te the, the technological capacity because they were sneaking stuff across the border that the only way you were going to find this thing is if you tuned into a specific radio station um, 
waited a reasonable amount of time and then moved the, the car into neutral, only then would the apartment open. Um, so it, it, it's, yeah, people go to great lengths, right? And that's why we say we can disassemble the vehicle at the border. Like, not a problem. Um, the one problem that does kind of come into play is, let's say we disassemble your vehicle because we think you have drugs, but again, we don't have to have any articulable suspicion. We just like, yeah, you probably have drugs. If we disassemble your entire vehicle, we don't reassemble it for you. It's basically like, yeah, you can get your vehicle and it's literally just parts. Um, so, you know, not great, but again, the idea is the border is we're trying to protect our citizens, we're trying to protect um, our national security, et cetera. So this is the way that people go through. Um, again, if we, and that's just for vehicles, if it's something other than a vehicle, right, like we want to get into your laptop, we're going to have to have an articulable suspicion. But at this point, you don't have a warrant requirement because you're at the border. Right, and the border is a special zone where we say, look, nobody thinks that they have an expectation of privacy, right? Any any government's going to question you and, and whatnot. Um, it's just something that, that you expect, right? Um, what's interesting is how nationality comes into play, right? So. Um, I went to a, I was presenting at a conference in India, in, in Delhi, India. And when I get there, I go through the customs line. Right? And the customs line took me about an hour and a half to go from the start of the, or the back of the line to where I could actually talk to a customs agent, or where they stand for passport. So I come through and the customs agent says, you know, why are you here? I had a, a um, tourist visa that's what they told us to get so I have tourist visa and I was like well um, you know I'm here on a tourist visa uh, to speak at a conference and then we're supposed to go see some sites they never told us what the sites we were gonna see were but he asked he's like so what are you gonna go see and I was like honestly I have no clue they just said there's gonna be an air-conditioned bus and we would just sit in it like I mean it was like legitimately kind of sketchy and he was just like mm, screw it uh let me in but the person behind me um was pakistani so if you don't know israel or india and pakistan hate each other like and they both have nukes um i mean they hate 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 so the guy behind me i think he was kind of other visa um they made him go through special screenings and all kinds of other stuff. It was, it was crazy. Um, same was true in December um, before COVID hit, I went to Australia to present at a conference. It was cool about Australia is like, I was getting ready for like this line, right? I was like, okay, it's gonna take an hour and a half to get through this damn line. Um, Cause at this point I was on the back of the plane. So I was like, yeah, it's gonna take forever. Uh, so I go up to the, follow the signs, you know, around the customs. And there's a sign that says US citizens, Canadian citizens, and Australian citizens this way. And another sign says every other nationality this way. If you were not a United States citizen, a Canadian citizen, or an Australian citizen, you had to go through the traditional customs, right? Where they ask you questions and make sure that you're not, you know, a terrorist or whatever. All I had to do was go like and because I was, it was a really quick process, was walk through a turnstile, which took your picture, printed you a receipt that said who you were and stuff like that, and then go down to baggage claim where I, the bags come down the chute. I grab my bag and I go out. On the way out, the, there's a marshal. And he says, oh, he's tell, asking everyone, can I see your receipt? Uh, I show him the receipt and I give him my, my declarations card. His declarations card said, um, you know, basically you have to declare if you're sneaking in drugs right, into the country. Um, and, it, and it doesn't say, and the way it's worded and is, is poor, but it basically says, um, do you have any controlled substances on your person? 
that you're bringing into this country. All right, and so the marshal, as I'm going through, he, he asked me, he goes, so do you have any um, controlled substances you're bringing into this country? And I said, yeah, and I hand him the card. I say, um, it's uh, clonopin and Adderall. And he goes, oh, that's it? Just for your use? And I was like, yep. He goes, okay, have a nice day, and just let me go. Meanwhile, the people behind me who were not white were having their bags torn apart, right? So it's, it's there is a racial under, un undercurrent, a nationality undercurrent um, of, and basically all it amounted to was profiling. So it, it, it's a very interesting process. If you ever want to feel violated, fly out of India. Um, like there are guards every four feet with machine guns. Um, they have you basically stripped down. I mean, like, like you think our TSA is unreasonable? Theirs is like, holy crap, unreasonable. And the idea, again, is to prevent terrorism, to prevent the, a war from Pakistan and India, et cetera. So that's just kind of the idea of like border searches, how they work if you haven't been out of the country. Now, that leads us to something that happens at traditional borders. They're called roving patrols. So as long as we're at the border or basically near the border, we don't need a reasonable suspicion. We don't need an articulable suspicion. We don't need anything to pull you over, right? Like, so you're driving, you're right near the border, you flip on their lights, have no reason to, and want to search your vehicle. They can't. You're at the border. But reasonable suspicion, so again, something that is beyond a, a hunch, right? Something that's articulable is required in areas away from it. So basically the further you get away from the border, the more suspicion is needed. All right, so if you're within like 10 miles of the border, you're, you're probably not gonna have, um, or, or you're not gonna need an articulable suspicion. But if you're getting like 20, 25 miles out from the border, then yeah, you're gonna have to have a reasonable articulable suspicion as to why you're pulling this person over. Um, and then beyond that, you still have to have reasonable suspicion, but for your purposes right now, you're at probable cause. So that kind of gives you an idea of, of, of international borders, um, like the physical components of it. Now, that brings us to the question about airport screenings, right? So we're talking here about non-international flights, right? Um, International flights, they're international border equivalents, right? The arrivals, departures, launches, airports. Um, but beyond that, when you go, if you're flying domestically through TSA, TSA screenings are also considered special needs searches, right? So the, the special needs are considered reasonable as long as the intrusion is minimal. Right? So this usually means an x-ray, metal detector, those um, full body scanners, because, and this is what we've articulated, one, there is a clear and present threat posed to aircrafts. There is a deterrent value in airport screenings, right? So the more severe we are at airports, the less likely it is that the terrorist is gonna try and sneak through. The notice provided to passengers in advance of entering screening allows them to decide whether or not to enter. All right, so that's why there are always posted signs that say TSA screening or, or things like that. The idea is you can make a rational decision. Do I want to go through this and get searched or do I not and just go home? And then we also say there's limited instances of abuse given the public nature of screening. All right, the idea is you're there in public so they're not going to like trample your rights. Now, we have run into some problems. Um, first, when those full body scanners came out, you could defeat them. Like, you could, like, they search your body, right, and then they, they give kind of like a, you look like a blob. It's not like they see your junk or anything like that. Um, but there was a way to defeat them. 
I don't know how they found it out, why they found it out, but very quickly after they announced that they were putting in full body scanners, uh, a group of scientists came out and said, you can hide a gun on your stomach as long as you cover the gun with a pancake. Like, I'm not kidding, literally a pancake. Uh, because the, the screener could not read or differentiate between the person's skin and the pancake. So it just showed nothing there. Right? It might show a bump or something like that, but, but it didn't show anything there. Um, they stopped implementation for a little bit, then reconfigured something, and, and now pancakes don't work anymore. So like, if you're wanting to like sneak stuff through TSA, you can try a pancake, but like it's probably not going to work, but you never know it might. Um, and then we've also had one of our justifications is limited instances of, the, of abuse given public natures of screenings. Um, we have pat downs, right? So you go through the full body scanner, they take, they x ray your luggage, all that jazz. You're putting your clothes back on, and a TSA person randomly, and they say random, but it's never random. It's always me. I don't know why, but it's, uh, like I'm not a threat, but it's always me. They'll come up and they'll say, oh, can you step over here, sir, uh, for an additional screening? And it's just supposed to be random pat downs, all right? Um, it's not usually that big of a deal because it's, it's just like getting patted down like you would be getting patted down by a police officer. Um, but there were instances where male TSA agents were targeting attractive female travelers and basically groping them um, as a part of this additional screening, right? And so there was a lot of issues that, that I brought up in a lawsuit. And now, again, when TSA searches you, usually they're going to use the backside of their hands. It's going to be somebody of your same gender um, or gender identity. Right, you can request somebody of your same gender or gender identity, and the pat downs are a lot less invasive in terms of like where they actually touch you. Um, you know, and 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 I person on a personal note, I think that's excessive, um, even on a reduced version of it, because you literally just went through a full body scan, right? So that tells me like there's still stuff out there that they know can defeat the body scanner, <laughs> but they're not telling the public, obviously. Um, so TSA has been deemed a special needs search, right? Special needs. Now courts are for other modes of transportation. So for instance, um, there was a case, um, McQuaid D. Kelly was a second circuit case and it dealt with New York subway screenings, right? Um, and the question was, can police pat you down, search you, whatever, when you walk down to a subway. Um, and the general rule is no. Like, it's a consent search. Um, they can't just de facto start going through your crap. Like, it's, it's a consent search. Now, what's interesting is, is living in Boston, when I was at the marathon when the bombing occurred and I worked on the case itself, but I was in Boston, before you, before the Boston bombing, they would have police randomly at different stations, right? And they would kind of stand in front of the gates and they would say randomly, um, oh, I just need you to go over there and, and let them look through your bag. That was considered a consent search. Even though, again, remember the consent searches, they don't have to tell you, you can say no and stuff like that. Um, you could have theoretically said no. And there was a guy I was with one time, we were in class together, we were riding the subway and he comes over to, no, we're going through and we're talking, he comes over to the guy and says, we need you to step over there and um, so they can look through your bag. And, he turned around to the cop and he said, you can go fuck yourself. Um, and the cop goes, oh, you think you're a smart ass? He's like, no, I just have a constitution that protects my rights. And like that shut the cop down. Like I was like, I was sitting there, I was just like, damn. Like 
I really wanted to join in, but I was scared. So um, that was before the marathon bombing, right? Um, and it, it raised really interesting questions because you're not allowed to disobey a lawful order from a police officer. Well, if the police officer is essentially ordering you to go over there and get your bag searched as opposed to asking you, then there's a question of, um, you know, is the search proper or is it not? But if we compare the, the, the pre-Boston Marathon bombing to the post-Boston Marathon bombing, um, trying to ride the subway for like two or three months after the Boston bombing, you had, Nash, you had um, National Guard troops in the, the subways uh, with, you know, big machine guns. Uh, and it was interesting was like, they didn't care. Um, like they just, and they, they profiled like nobody's business, but like they, they didn't care. They weren't as concerned as the police were, or CSA were, like they were just, just kind of there as a deterrent. That being said, you could theoretically, you can take the subway to Boston's Amtrak station. It has two Amtrak stations. Right? One that goes up north, one that goes south. Um, there is no screenings when you board an Amtrak train. As long as you have your ticket, there's no screening. You just walk down the path and get on your train and take your seat. Um, now, sometimes it was the same station that had the commuter rail. So like, I just watched the Amtrak trains. Uh, sometimes they would have like drug sniffing dogs or they would have bomb dogs just in the area, right? And the idea is if there's something there, the dogs can hit on it. And that was, that happened sometimes, sometimes it didn't. But there were no other screenings. So the question then becomes, okay, why can I get a ride, an Amtrak train, right? And without any screening, but I can't get on a plane without any screening. Well, obviously 9-11 uh, had a lot to do with it, but also think about trains. Like what the hell can you really do with a train? Um, you can't like drive trains into buildings or anything like that. Um, worst thing you can do is like blow up a train or get derailed. Uh, so I mean, you know, it's, it's on tracks. Like there's a certain path that it goes, uh, and a lot of stuff now can be controlled electronically. So you know, there, there, there's not as much of a threat as there is with the plane, right? Where somebody can take over the plane and and do what we saw on September 11th. So. You know, just think about that when you're going through, if you go to a big city that, and they say, oh, uh, you just step over here when you search your bag or something along those lines, just say no and keep walking because they can't do a thing about it, right? Um, if they try, then you can sue. Um, so just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. If you decide to travel to a big city, which I don't really recommend right now, especially with COVID resurgence happening as the weather cools. So this leads us to the next question I have is, what about public high schools? So there's a famous case called Tinker versus Des Moines, right? Um, which is a free speech case, actually. And if you walk into my office and, and look on the bookcases, immediately you should come in, hanging on the bookcase is a copy of the case that's actually signed by the girl who was the, 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 the star basically of this case, right? She's an old woman now, but I had her hand sign it and like have it framed because I'm a nerd. Uh, but from this case, we get a quote. Students do not shed their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gate. However, and that's where it ends, but that's usually what we see a lot, right? So you don't shed your rights at the schoolhouse gate. However, the special characteristics of the school environment may make regulation necessary, right? So while that comes from a First Amendment case, it does apply theoretically to the rest of, of, of the amendments, right? So that being said, how the case law has panned out is students have a Fourth Amendment right to be free from unreasonable searches. Though this right can be overcome by schools' reasonable suspicion 
instead of probable cause, so long as the scope of the search is reasonable. Um, so again, this is where, again, we're talking reasonable suspicion, so just a little bit more likely than not, but there, you have to have some kind of articulable reason for it. You can search without probable cause. Again, assuming that the search, the scope of the search is reasonable. So we had Stafford Unified School District versus Reading. Um, it dealt with strip searches. Um, and if I recall correctly, the, 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 the girl that was at issue had like aspirin or something on her. And they made her do a strip search. They took her down to the nurse's office and they you know, had her like empty out her bra and, and, and things like that. And they're like, hey, that's not reasonable, right? Um, but the, they were searching theoretically for drugs, and so the question is, what would a reasonable person believe is in that situation? Would a strip search at a school be reasonable? Then we have Potawatomi's County versus Earls. This is athletic drug testing, right? So um, this question is, can we force high school students, public high school students, who want to participate in athletics to take drug tests, like urine tests? The answer is usually, yeah, we can, because it's something the student chooses to do, right? So they've elected to do this thing. So they should kind of know going in that like that's a possibility. Um, urine testing is not invasive. Right? It's like, here, pee in this cup, I won't watch, and then give me the cup, and we'll go from there. Right? So there is very little damage or, or risk to be done. So the Supreme Court basically said, athletic drug testing, that's fine. Right? Um, you agree to it. Now, if they tried to do drug testing via blood, that would probably be a whole different analysis. Right? Urine, there's no real invasiveness. If we're sticking a needle in your arm, then we're invasive. So again, we have to have, walk that thin line, but just know that if we elect to do something beyond just regular schoolwork, we do an extracurricular, and Padawami has kind of gone, taken this and gone from a very long stance, has said that if you engage in any extracurricular activity, you can be subject to drug testing or searches or whatever that's reasonable under the circumstances. So, if you were researched in the high school, this is what governed it. Now, that being said, one thing I want to note um, is that crime has been steadily declining for the past 20 years. Um, there has been a significant increase in the number of school shootings during this time period. So could this justify similarly styled searches in public schools? All right, and the idea is, is, is searches that um, are more invasive, right? Because we see that school shootings are on the rise, right? So if we have reasonable suspicion, and is the scope reasonable? Well, if we're searching for somebody for aspirin, that scope of that search is gonna be a lot less than if we're searching somebody for a gun, right? Um, searching somebody for aspirin, there's a different reasonableness standard than there would be searching somebody for a gun. The problem is, is also consider where these things are located, right? So consider the south side of Chicago versus Beverly Hills. South side of Chicago, a lot of police now won't even respond to calls in the south side um, because of how violent it is um, and officers are targeted. And there's, in Chicago, there is basically a school shooting every day. Um, it doesn't make the news because it's usually like one student just kills another student like gang related or something along those lines. They're not out just blankly firing rounds, right? So it's not, quote, sexy enough to make the nightly news. Um, but they have to go through metal detectors, they have to get patted down, things along those lines, and, and still slips through. Uh, versus Beverly Hills, where Beverly Hills is predominantly very wealthy and virtually no violence, right? So should we have a standard that's reasonable in one place, but not reasonable in another? Like, how do we contextualize this, right? And this is what the Supreme Court has to deal with and wrestle with. Like, if they're passing, or if, if, they're, if they're coming down with precedent, 
they have to understand how far this can reach, right? Otherwise, there's going to be another case that goes up to the Supreme Court. Um, so they might say, yeah, South Side of Chicago is out of control, but if you look at the rest of the country, you know, there's not really that many shootings and blah, 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 blah. Um, so we're going to say it's reasonable based upon the conditions. Right? So maybe it's reasonable on South Side of Chicago based upon its conditions to be more invasive of students. Um, whereas in Beverly Hills, where we know there's less crime and it's affluent and all that jazz, maybe there's a lesser reason to go through things and to um, conduct invasive searches. Just a couple other special needs searches, uh, motor vehicle checkpoints. So Reed City of Indianapolis versus Edmond. Um, this deals basically with um, DUI checkpoints and um, checkpoints for people who are wanted, things along those lines. That's uh, a special needs search. Workplace drug testing, again, this constitutes a Fourth Amendment search. We have to look at government interests, intrusiveness, and warrants are impracticable, so we only need an articulable suspicion. If you are on bail, probation, or parole, you have waived your rights, right? You have waived your rights. So we can search you for any reason, no reason, randomly, whatever. We can go through everything that you own just because we woke up in a bad mood. You've given them up. Like by accepting bail, by accepting probation, by accepting parole, you have implicitly said, I give up these rights. Now we'll compare that to correctional institutions, so prisons. In correctional institutions, there's no expectation of privacy. Right, nothing, there's no expectation of privacy, none. That's the whole point of prison, right? So generally speaking, we don't need a warrant, we don't need suspicion, we don't need much of anything to go through your stuff. Uh, now that does depend a little bit on the type of prison it is. So if it's a, let's say a federal prison camp, which doesn't have barbed wire walls or anything like that, um, you have a foot locker. Well, maybe we need some kind of suspicion to get through it, but the idea is you're in a correctional institution. Like, you've lost this right for the period that you are confined, right? And then, theoretically, you have parole after that. You've lost that right through parole. But the day that parole ends, that you've completed probation and parole successfully, your right of the Fourth Amendment is restored. So your voting rights aren't restored and things like that aren't restored, but your Fourth Amendment right against unreasonable searches and seizures is restored. So next class, we're going to look at Terry stops and reasonable suspicion.